Ready to dominate at the plate? Blast Baseball is trusted by more major league and college teams than any other hitting solution. The Blast sensor attaches to the knob of any bat, providing real-time feedback with every swing. Go to BlastMotion.com and enter code NOWD1 at checkout to save $25. All right, everybody, let's get right into it. I'm Alan Gay, and this is Now D1 Speaks. we got a great show today. It's a show I've absolutely been looking forward to. We've got Jen Drummond with us. She is a former D1 athlete. She's an author. She's a podcaster. She's a mother. She's a world record holder. She has a lot of titles. Absolutely thrilled that she's taking a little bit of time out of her day to be with us. Hey, Jen, are you there? I am here. Thank you for having me today. Absolutely. Thank you for being with us. Hey, why don't you kind of kick it off and maybe just give us a little introduction of of who you are? Yes. So um, you did a great intro, but I'm a mom of seven, an entrepreneur, a lifetime athlete that's kind of evolved into different fields and ways of keeping that in my life. And just an overall show me something new and let me give it a try personality. I love it. Well, let's kind of get into this. I got to tell you, I mean, you got a fantastic career. Yeah, you got a great life that's going on. And I mean, there's a lot of places I think that we could start. But I think one thing that really makes the most sense, at least for me, is just kind of the way you've been able to overcome adversity. And, and what I'm specifically talking about is kind of reflecting back. I think you had a kind of a you had a car accident several years ago, 2018 or so. Just kind of give us what how that experience really influenced some of your perspective on just really setting uh, your goals for your life and really being able to achieve them as well yeah so 2018 was definitely a line in the sand um prior to that i was at a stage in my life where i was coasting um i had kids at home i was a stay-at-home mom i wasn't really doing me because i convinced myself that there wasn't time And that once my kids get to college, then I'd get back to me. And I think we all have a version of that if then statement, right? If this happens, then I can. Or when that happens, then I will. And um, I got into a car wreck. I collided with a semi, flipped three times, um, side spun probably another 12, ended up upside down in the median, went to the hospital. We have no clue how I survived, let alone walked away, but pretty much did unscathed. And I got a call from the police a couple weeks after the accident. And they said, we have rebuilt this accident over 50 times and we cannot build a scenario where you walk away, let alone live. Hmm. And so I'm in this space of like, why was I saved? Oh my goodness. Life is magic. I'm no longer afraid of um, like what people will think of my decisions. Now I'm going to run out of time to do all the things I want to do in life. So it was definitely, I realized I don't get to choose when I die, but I sure get to choose how I live. And I need to start living because coasting is doing zero favors for anybody. Coasting is so easy, isn't it? It's a, it's a subtle trap that you just kind of fall into. So I, I love that. I mean, well, I don't love that you had this accident, but what an epiphany that, that you really realized, hey, you, you have the one life and here's my opportunity. And I know so many of the, the, um, uh, of our, our listeners, which are our core audience is really uncommitted prospects, man, they're trying to make a difference in their life. And I know they're going to be able to relate to what it is that you're, that you've already lived through. Talk to us a little bit about, uh, the climbing the Southern summits. I mean, you're a world record holder. And I think, you know, one thing I think is so fascinating when you did your introduction, you said, Hey, I'm a mom of seven and you've also climbed seven summits it's like you had already yes. kind of you'd already kind of climbed those summits already haven't you by having those seven kids but talk to us oh about climbing goodness. all seven <laughs> yeah let me tell you seven children would get you in the mindset to take on about anything so thank you kids for <laughs> providing that platform for me to succeed in other areas of life but you know so 2019 at the year after the accident became a year of the bucket list who am i what's my legacy what do i want to be known for what do i want to do on that list 2020, I was turning 40. So when I was looking at this list of all the things I can came up with, I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to climb a mountain for my 40th birthday and launch that next decade with something significant like that. And I was training for a mountain named Ama de Blom. 
And it's a mountain that is the Paramount Pictures logo. So I'm like, oh, that's a cool mountain. It's in Nepal. Every single time I think, watch a movie, I'll think, oh, I climbed that mountain the rest of my life. Well, COVID entered the scene in the beginning of 2020, and I wasn't going anywhere to climb any mountain. In fact, I became a homeschool teacher to seven children because all the schools shut down. <laughs> so um, I remember teaching and helping one of my kids with his math, and he was struggling, and I gave him that pep talk, like, we do hard things. You've got this. He looks at me and he goes, mom, if we do hard things, why are you climbing a mountain called I'm a dumb <laughs> Mount Everest? I said, honey, it's Ama de Blom, not blonde, but thank you. And so I, you know, like we, he finished his homework. We looked at Everest. He went to bed. I was still looking at Everest and I thought, wait, why not climb Everest? If he thinks it's the hardest mountain in the whole world. I'm going to show him that whatever Everest is, we can climb it. So I call a coach about climbing. I'd been an athlete, but I hadn't been an uphill mountaineer. So this guy was a specialist in that area. And he's like, yes, I can get you ready. Buy this book about becoming an uphill athlete. So I bought the book. And in the front of the book, there was a lady who got a Guinness World Record for doing something in the Alps. And I just remember reading that. And when my coach called, I was like, I could have done that coolest mom in the whole world if I had a Guinness world record are you kidding me and my coach is like all right I'll think of something I'm like okay cool think of something but I'm not growing pumpkins or speed eating hot dogs or doing the other weird things that that record book has he's like don't worry about it I'll think of something good and a few weeks later he calls back and he goes Jen I have the perfect world record for you I'm like okay he's like I think you should be the first female to climb the seven second summits I'm like, that's a tongue twister. I don't even know what you're talking about. He's like, no, no, listen. He goes, the seven second summits are the second highest point on each of the seven continents. They're harder than the first seven. It's only been done by one male. You'd be the first woman to do it. And he goes, think about it. Seven kids, seven mountains, seven continents. It sounds like a jackpot. I said, it does kind of sound like a jackpot. And so I looked at it and I thought, you know what? We have this one life. I'm going to go for it and we'll see what happens. And that's how it started. Man, I love it. So, all right. So tell us which was the first summit and what year was it? And how long did it take you from that point to where you had accomplished the seventh one as well? Yeah. Okay. So my first one actually ended up being Ama de Blom, even though it's not a second summit. I did that to uphold my 40th birthday present to myself. <laughs> and then um, I kind of dictated mountains that I was going to climb based on when they opened, because this is when COVID was exiting the scene and things started to go back to normal. So my first mountain was in South America named Ojos del Salado, which is located in Chile in the Atacama Desert. And, um, so I climbed that in December of 2020 and then went to climb these other mountains. I failed two of them the first mm. time. So K2 took me to attempts. Mount Logan took me to attempts. And I summited the last one, which was Mount Logan on my second try, June 1st of 2023. So it took me two and a half years to get it all done. That seems like a really short time, actually. It probably seemed like a it, long time to you. That is a super short time. It, well, it's one of those things when you set a goal, right? It, well, I, I never slept in a tent before, okay? <laughs> like, I, I climbed up a ski hill once to ski down it. Otherwise, I've taken lift chairs. Like, I was not a mountaineer. So, for me, it was so much new in the beginning. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I, what did I say yes to? This is never going to – you know, like, you have all that doubt. And then you start getting momentum and you start knocking some of them off your list halfway through. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm halfway through. And then all of a sudden when you have one left, you're kind of sad. Like this mm. thing's going to be done. Like, what does this mean? This gave me so much purpose and direction. And I loved the process. I loved the people. I loved all of it. And so I was grateful by all means, grateful that I had success and I have the world record, but you go through all the emotions. Hey, tonight we're with Jen Drummond on Now D1 Speaks podcast. And you can find Now D1 Speaks on YouTube, Apple, Spotify. It's on all the indies. If you like this type of content, I would ask that you go out and find us, subscribe, listen to a few, rate us five stars. I would certainly appreciate it. Again, this is Now D1 Speaks, and we were with Jen Drummond. 
Well, let me ask you a couple of things. Well, I mean, I'm just thinking about this. Did you, did you go with just your coach or was there a whole team that, that would climb each summit with you? Yeah. So every mountain was a different team for the most part. Um, different mountains had different technical skills needed. They had different topography to climb and navigate. Uh, like for example, when I climbed in Antarctica, that mountain had only been climbed times before. So wow. it was myself and a team of four guides. And the reason why we needed four guides is because if there was an injury on the mountain, there's no rescue helicopter, right? They can't fly helicopters in Antarctica. It's too cold. And so the only thing they can fly is a plane, which means if somebody gets hurt, we have to get them to where the plane can land to rescue them. So it was very interesting in how much you play to the conservative side in these extreme environments to mitigate as much risk as possible. Um, and then when we did um, Mount Logan, the first time we went, we had a team of eight of us. And then the second time we went, we only had a team of three because we mm -hmm. kind of learned that less was better in that type of environment. And it's just, it's interesting. Different mountains have different things and different protocol. That's really cool. Was there ever a point where you were just like, you know what, I'm not going to be able to do this. And, and, and if you were thinking that, what was it that kind of flipped the switch to where you were able to overcome that adversity? And then you knew, you know what, I am going to accomplish this. Yeah. So there was a point I'm not a rock climber as much as I am a mountaineer and there is a difference, but Mount Kenya is a 20 pitch rock climb. And so you're in a harness, you're in rock shoes, you're tied to a rope. You have to, you know, Spider-Man up a wall and there's this, like, it's the crux move on this climb. And I'm sure it's not as crazy as my brain made it out to be. But, you know, when you're scared, you blow up the negativity and you think like this is never going to happen. So there's a spot where they call it a chimney kind of. And I'm facing the wall climbing up and I need to go to the other side, which is behind me. I'm not tall enough to straddle and go to the other side. So I kind of have to push off this one wall and then jump and turn to the other one. Okay. And I am scared of heights, which is not a good thing to be in mountaineering, but it is what it is. And I was just the guide that I was climbing with. It was only him and I, his English wasn't great. And so I'm like, do you have the rope? Do you have the rope? And he's like, yes. And I had to give myself the biggest pep talk the entire time I was in this section. <laughs> and finally I'm like, okay, if I don't go now, I'm never going to go. So I'm sweating. I want to cry. I want all the emotions. I scream the entire time I do this jump twist thing and get on the other wall. And I tell you what, when I scrambled up to a spot where I could stand, I had to shake and dance just to get all the nerves out of me still. Right. Like I didn't <laughs> scream them out. They were still in my body. And I just was like, I could do anything now that I did that. Mm. We're great. That is awesome. Thank you for sharing that so much. And, and one other thing that kind of stood out to me and I can appreciate this so much when, once you finish, you were kind of sad. I think that was the emotion. It was almost like, gosh, I, you know what? I did it. So I've got to be thinking to myself for you, what's next? Is that the, is that the end of your climbing career or will there be another world record for you? Or like, what's the thing that's maybe kind of sitting out there that's uh, kind of tickling your fancy? Oh man, there's so, well, this is what happens. You go to like, Oh, I have this goal of seeing the seven continents. So I can't wait to go see Antarctica right? Mm -hmm. Then you get to Antarctica and you're like, oh, I want to go do that. I want to see this. I want to experience that. Like it opens the door to so many more opportunities and ideas and concepts that you didn't even know existed until you stepped foot on that continent. And that happened on every place that I went. So what I promised myself is we seem to be a society of what's next. And I know that I need to rest and recover and just recharge my batteries and recalibrate. So this year is a year of doing that. And I'm not allowing myself to commit to anything else until nice. I have a little more time to just be and not. I'm really good at human doing. I'm not always so good at human being. And this is a challenge of human being. Hey, congratulations. You're living a fantastic life. You're doing things that only I 
a small percentage of people have ever had an opportunity to go and see. So congratulations. And, and let me ask you one last thing about this period of your life in particular. Are you still a homeschool mom? Oh, no, I am not. Thank you, teachers. Thank you, school systems. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. It was your son, right? I'm a dumb blonde. That, that's the, yes. the whole segment yes. I'm always going to think about. That was fantastic. Well, let's talk about the uh, an, another accomplishment you have. You've got a book that's coming out. I think it's going to I think it may already be available for a pre-sale, but officially it's going to be on sale at the beginning of the year. And it's break proof. And I think it really focuses on being resilient. And again, it's kind of like the seven summits, but it is really um, being resilient really placed our core audience of uncommitted athletes. Kind of share with us maybe some strategies from your book that would really be relevant to uncommitted prospects. Yeah. Um, you know, so I named the book Break Proof because I think in the breaks we have in life, we have proof of what's working, mm. what's not working, what we need to shift. Is this even our mountain or our thing that we want to take on? Or now that we're in this location, do we have other opportunities that we want to pursue? So break proof isn't saying like we're never going to break, but it's saying that when you do, look at that as an opportunity to provide you feedback on what you're trying to do, what you're trying to achieve, and what still needs to be done. So when someone reads the book, I'm going to take you on the adventure of each climb and highlight a lesson that I've learned from climbing that's helped build my resilience and be able to be like, oh, okay, this is part of the process. For example, I used Mount Everest, which is the highest mountain in the world, to train for K2, which is the second highest mountain in the world. Hmm. Um, and when I first got into climbing, I thought it just took you weeks to go from base camp to Everest back to base camp and then home. I didn't realize at this time that there's this thing called acclimatizing. And acclimatizing means that you get to base camp and then you'll go up the mountain, camp one, camp two, maybe camp three. You're going to go to you hit a point of failure. And that point of failure is actually a good sign. And so that stresses your body out. And after you hit that point of failure, you're going to go back down to base camp. And you're going to eat dinner and you're going to do things for about three days. And over the course of those three days, your body physiologically changes and produces more red blood cells. So the next time you go up the mountain, you can go higher because you have more red blood cells to operate in the lesser oxygenated environment. And I think so many times we set these goals for ourselves that we think we just go from base camp to the summit. And we forget that we have acclimatization rotations. So if you're at a point in your career or a point in your life or a point in your pursuit that you're hitting failure, stop. Go back to the base camp. Go back to the ballroom. Go back to the boardroom and look at that experience and say, okay, what do I know now? What do I need to train? What do I need to do different? How do I take this knowledge so I can go higher up the mountain the next time I go out? And just having that word acclimatizing, I feel gives us permission to be okay with where we are and then make adjustments from there. It's good stuff right there. Break proof. Now, if someone wanted to go ahead and get a copy, what's, what's the best way? How, how can they find your book? You know, Amazon, right? Everybody buys everything on Amazon these days. So you can go Amazon, type in break proof or type in Jen Drummond and it will show up. And if you order it in pre-sales, we give you a whole bunch of fun little perks that are pretty cool. Awesome. Good stuff right there. Now, let me ask you about your own kind of your personal life, you know, and as well as your professional life. And this is something that certainly comes up with athletes. And I know you can respect that having been a former uh, D1 soccer player as well. I mean, balancing academics with your athletic endeavors was a challenge. Talk to us about your personal life, professional life and athletic adventures that you're having at the age of 40 right now. How have you been able to balance all of that and still be successful? You know, it's a constant checking in and balancing act. It's not, hey, I figured it out and you leave it on the shelf and make it work. I'm evaluating my schedule on a weekly basis and I'm actually planning out in a longer term basis as well. So in the week that I'm coming up on, I'll look at my calendar and I'm like, okay, well, I'm a mom first. 
So I know I'm a mom first. So I need to make sure my calendar shows that I'm a mom first. Then I'm a business owner. And then I'm an athlete because that's the stage of life that I'm at. And so what that means is my athletic activities get fit between these two other pieces. And sometimes it looks like, where is that going to go? And so then what I need to do is I need to look at my calendar and say, okay, guess what? One of my kids has a soccer game on Wednesday night. So I'm going to bring a 12 inch step and a backpack full of water bottles. And for that entire soccer game, I'm going to do step ups and watch the game and still get a fitness in. It might not be perfect, right? It's not on the mountain in the environment, but it's better than a zero. And so I always just try to not have zeros because I really feel it's just these little accumulations of things that get us to this end goal. With technology these days, I have meetings on Zoom. Some of them are, I don't need to be on camera. There's AI robots that can take notes from your Zoom meeting. So I'll listen. I'll be on a treadmill at an incline with probably a weighted vest on. And I'll participate at a different level than if I was sitting at a chair. But I have all the notes to catch any important things so I don't have to write all the things down. So it allows me to get some of my workouts in like that. And a lot of times I might have three workouts a day instead of one three-hour workout. And that's okay. Again, thank you for the support from all of our listeners, not only for Now D1 Speaks, but for Jen Drummond as well. If you'd like to be a part of this type of environment, I'd ask that you just reach out to me. The easiest way is to find me on X, formerly known as Twitter. My handle is at now underscore D1. Just send me a DM and we will figure out a schedule. I love that you said I'm a mom first, and I can absolutely appreciate that. I, I mean, hey, Jen, we don't know each other, but I will tell you, you know, I've been married for 30 years. We homeschooled our kids, and I shouldn't say we, my, my wife did, and uh, we have two God kids. God bless her. Good for her. No, no <laughs> doubt about it. So I thought that was really interesting when you jumped out there and, and you had an opportunity to homeschool for a little while. I can't imagine trying to do it for for seven, even for a short period of time. But I love that you put mom first. I want to kind of talk about the inspiration that you get from your kids. You know, how, how is that a source of in, inspiration as well as a challenge? And then really just kind of your, your whole, just being a mother, how has that impacted your journey and the, the way you approach various challenges? Yeah, you know, I think one of the biggest things, again, from the accident that a takeaway was, is they're watching so they were watching me before, and I, mean, I was happy, but I wasn't thriving. I wasn't alive, chasing something, getting beat up in the arena and having to put myself back together. I was just telling them like what that was like. When I took on this pursuit, I was in the arena with them, right? Yeah, I don't want to work out today either. I don't want to eat healthy either. I don't want to have to like say no to hanging out with my friends because I need to get a hike in so that I'm safer on the mountain. And it just allowed us to do life in parallel. Here's what mom's doing, very similar to you. Here's what you're doing. Both of us visually could see each other making those sacrifices, doing those things. And every time it got hard on the mountain, I would pull out a photo of my kids. Mm. And I'm like, okay, they're watching. What would I want them to do right now? What can I demonstrate for them? that would make everybody happy. And one particular story comes to mind. I was on K2. K2 is a monster of a mountain. Like it is crazy. I was the third American female to summit. Mm. And my first year that I was there, a teammate of mine died in an avalanche. Mm. And he was lower on the mountain than me. And I, you know, you read about it, you hear about it happening. It's just when it hits that close to home on your team, you don't even know where to place that in your mind. And I was on the mountain and another team came up and they're saying my name a few times. And finally I registered, they were talking to me and they're like, Hey, Jen, your team's going down. Do you want to join us to summit or do you want to go back down with your team? And I'm like, you know, I've been there for weeks. I'm two days from the summit. There's definitely a sliver of me that wanted to summit. But I said to them, like, no, I'm here. The mountain will always be here. I'm going to go down and take care of my teammate and take care of my team and make sure everybody's good. So I got back to the United States and my kids came home from camp. And I remember one of my guys coming up to me and say, hey, mom, did you summit? I said, no, I didn't, but I had success. 
And he looked at me with confused eyes. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, hey, who we show up as people is way more important than anything we'll ever achieve. And I'm proud of the person that I showed up as. And here's what happened. And here's the decision I made. And in life, you're going to have choices where you can put the summit in front of people. And we call it people over peaks at my house. And I hope that you always put people over peaks, whatever that peak is. And so for me, the kids have just been this anchor of what do I want them to see and what do I want them to emulate? And that's the model that I need to live so that they have something to look at. Man, that's fantastic right there. It's not always about the end goal. It's that entire process. And I love that you're putting in it a perspective of, of little eyes that are looking at you and, and trying to figure out why you're doing the things that you're doing and be, to be able to look them back in the eye and say, hey, this is why I'm doing it and to be proud of it and it makes sense. That's what it's all about. That's a great story, Jen. I mean, it's, it really kind of leads me into to thinking about how one of your goals, I know, is really living a life of significance, you know, and, and being able to inspire others. And it, just kind of elaborate on what, what does that mean to live a life of significance? You know, if you're an athlete, you've seen the movie Rudy, right? He's not the best player. He's not anything. But that guy shows up every day and rallies the troops and is inspired and inspiring. And we have the ability to be that person no matter where we are in life. Whether I'm the most valuable player on the field or the most valuable player on the bench, what we do and the energy we bring to each day affects people around us. And I will tell you that any person that I've met that's hit success in their life, they're now on the path of how do I turn the success into something significant? Who cares if Jen Drummond is the first female to climb the seven second summits if I don't help pave the path or make more possible for others after me? And so I think when we are given these opportunities to show up and succeed and have everything fall in place, it's our responsibility to help make that easier for the next person. Man, I got to tell you, Jen, you're touching a lot of people to, tonight. I mean, that is really hitting the core of our audience again as, as just being uncommitted uh, athletes trying to get on with their lives. And it's not just getting to that next level and being able to play baseball. It's really setting themselves up for the rest of their life. Their career in baseball will certainly come to an end at some point, no matter how talented you are. But it's really putting yourself in a position to to live a life of significance, to really have an impact over the next 40, 50 years. And that, that's where these kids are trying to get to. So thank you for being on. I have just absolutely enjoying this evening. I know you're going to be, your, your words in, in your life and, and the way you're able to share details absolutely going to touch a lot of people tonight. So I, I really do appreciate it. Um, let's talk about Seek Your Summit. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. I know you got the Seek Your Summit podcast, but you also have Seek Your Summit programs. And that's really turning physical challenges into transformations, empowering types of transformations. Talk to us about that and, and really maybe some of the concepts that go along with that that can help our young athletes that'll be listening. Yeah. So I run a couple different programs, um, mainly all because I needed them, right? So I'm like, I have this <laughs> pain point. How do I solve it? And then how do I share it? And one of the programs that came up is the Everest Challenge. It's a 40 day challenge where you climb Mount Everest from the comfort of your home. So when I went to climb Everest in 2021, I summited, but a whole bunch of my friends that I met there and made there did not. So they went back to Everest in 2022 to give it a second go. And Everest is just such a magical experience, right? And everybody just connects at a level because of their goal and all these fun things. And I was so sad I wasn't going back. I can't go back. I've already climbed it. I have other mountains I need to climb and I have a family that I need to take care of. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to climb Everest from home and I'm going to put <laughs> together a little challenge that I can do it at home and I'm going to let other people join in. And so it was this pilot program. I'm like, I don't even know if anybody will sign up. And I had people from all random walks of life sign up. And every day I just did this little mindset talk or this little piece. And really the whole story of this Everest thing is 
it's the teeny tiny things that add up, right? It's the little habits. It's the little thing where in between lunch, I had 10 minutes. So I ran up and down my staircase 10 times and I got 100 feet in. That 100 feet over 40 days all of a sudden starts adding up and becomes real numbers. And so it was super fun to do this. And so that's one program that I run when I left for expedition, I would be gone. And so 40 days before I left, I would do a parenting challenge. And that was basically Mm -hmm. just a little check-in for myself to make sure I connected with my kids. And when I was done with my last climb, one of my kids came up to me and said, mom, does that mean we don't get to do the connection challenge anymore? (laughs) And I'm like, I didn't even know you liked it that much. I said, no, we'll do it. And then I ended up sharing it with other parents. And it's just you know, fun little things you can do that change up the mundane and make ordinary extraordinary. It's good stuff, man. I love the way the kids inspire you. So how can somebody find one of these programs? What's the best way to, to, to find that online? Yeah, check out my website. So jendrummond.com. It has all the programs, all the things I'm into. You can buy the books, social media handles, all that good stuff. Awesome. Let's talk about podcasts. And I can't think of a, yes. uh, you know, kind of near and dear to my heart, certainly. Just tell us about your podcast, your, the Seek Your Summit podcast, how it got started. What was the inspiration behind it? What's the, um, the overall theme of the podcast? Yeah. So I have a podcast called Seek Your Summit. And, you know, I think like a lot of ideas in life that come at you left field and you're like, OK, I'm curious. I'll try it. I'll see what's happening. And a friend of mine's like, you should start a podcast. It'll get you really good at interviewing and talking to people. And you have a platform that you can elevate other stories. I'm like, okay, sounds good. I was terrible at it in the beginning. (laughs) I thought I'd be good at it. I was not good in the beginning at all, which is just a reminder that no matter where we are in life, we're beginners again. And it's still fun to get through the other side. And now that I've been doing it for a while, um, just like you, right? It's fun. You hear other people's <laughs> stories. You hear other things that people are up to and how they add significance to the world and how they figured out and went from left to right and then right to left. And it's just, I love people. Well, that's interesting. I got to say, it's funny to hear you say you were awful at it because I got to tell you, you are a fantastic guest. I have thoroughly enjoyed this evening. I think you're a fascinating uh, character and you're an awesome person, a great mother. And you've just having a fantastic life. And I'm, I'm happy for you. I'm proud of you. And I can't wait to hear what the next thing is that you're going to be doing after this year of kind of just taking it easy and, and a little bit of reflection and where you're going to go next, I think is really exciting. But I will put you on the spot just a little bit. One final question. And it's a question I like to ask everybody that kind of comes on here. And it's really geared toward kids and, and specifically young athletes, really kind of freshmen in high school. And I'm always interested, especially somebody with your perspective, if, a, if there's a young athlete, freshman, really getting started in their high school career, and they're a very athletic, good athlete, and they want to be good for as long as they can be, maybe what are some principles or strategies they could put in place today that will kind of help them long term? Um, one, make sure you're having fun. I think sometimes we can turn play into work. And then we just don't get the joy out of it. So pausing and realizing like we get to do this sport. We get to be good at this. We get to improve and having that mindset of this is fun. This is play. This is just experiencing our bodies to the limits and pushing them. I also really am a big fan of recovery. It's really hard for me. I love the days where I'm exhausted and beat myself up. And I, that feeling of just, you know, you went to your edge. And so those days that I'm doing nothing are really hard for me. But those are the days that your body gets to absorb all the training that you've done and really let it compound and take you forward. I got to tell you, that's great advice right there. And I can't think of a better way to really kind of wrap up this evening, but I do want to tell you one more time, Jen, just thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely appreciate it. I know that you're going to touch a lot of lives this evening. So just thank you for taking out a little bit of time just to to be on our show and and to share some of your life experiences. No, well, I really appreciate the opportunity. So thank you. And with that, I think we will just say good night. Hey, let me ask you something. Are you ready to dominate at the plate this season? Blast Baseball is the number one hitting improvement solution. 
trusted by more major league, college, and travel ball teams than any other. The blast sensor attaches to the knob of any bat, providing real-time feedback with every swing. Metrics are automatically sent to a smartphone app, generating insights that allow you to analyze and improve your hitting like never before. Go to BlastMotion.com and enter code NOWD1 and you will save $25 at checkout. Unlock your potential with Blast. Blast. 